how you guys doing? We're talking to the LA Clash at the Coliseum. So just first and foremost, uh, I just, I don't really enter a lot of lines for this. Haven't done it since I left the big oval. Uh, I just don't have a reason to. Why would I waste a lot of money on this event when I'm like throwing a thousand at Daytona in two weeks following it? Like there's just no reason to do that. So like for me, I, I do like three to five lines for the Clash and that's it. Like there's no reason to just dump all your money that you've saved up during the off season for this trash event. Okay. <clears throat> When we, do, when we do look at this race and we analyze it from a DFS perspective and see how it broke down and everything, there's a lot of asterisks that we just got to add on like every single race they've had here. So we've been here twice. And when we look at the last two races, so we look back at 2022 and we can look back at 2023, which we will do here. And we'll, uh, we'll get context and stuff from the races and stuff. But uh, when we look at this year's event and the fact that they're making it to where there is only uh, 23 cars in the race, okay, Yes, they're trying to, to bring down the chaos. They're trying to bring down the, uh, the, the bit of embarrassment that they saw last year. And they're trying to make it to where it's a lot friendlier in terms of guys just not dumping everybody, okay? We saw a lot of things happen last year in this event. And you can see, looking at the fast laps alone, that we have a lot of fast cars being knocked back, being knocked out of the race, being involved in wrecks, and we're considering a fast car really anybody over over 10 laps. When we look at both of the clashes, we're typically seeing people, most of the field's going to get around four fast laps. That's just how it is. Yeah, sure, like we're not expecting Burton, we're not expecting these slower guys to get laps led, but everybody else, like, hey, for, for the most part, we can project everybody from like two to four, five fast laps. That's just how it is. So everybody gets an extra point there in terms of projections, in terms of entering this race. And then you look at the guys who are carrying speed, either in their heats or practice and things of that nature. And you can kind of tell who's going to be fast, who's not going to be fast and things of that nature, at least in a, in a micro uh, analytical point of view for like dosing out like two to three fast laps per drivers. I think this, at least for me, when I, when I look at this race, I'm like, how am I going to build projections for this race? I might not be playing a lot of lineups, but I want to land on the guys that are projecting well or that have a chance of winning and things of that nature, like I have the last couple of years. I don't think I've had... Let me look back real fast. Let me... Let me... Let me... Where did I go last year? Because I don't think I have the sheet for the 2022. What lineups did I play here? Let's see. Yeah, man, I didn't have... Priest and Trix together. Eric Amarola got through. Okay, cool. That's kind of where I was at. Anyway, the reason I was looking at this and the reason why I want to do that is because, like, I'm able to nail the guys who are getting, at least last year's, at least last year's race, was I able to nail the guys who either got laps led or fast laps. Well, Eric Amarola, you know, check both those boxes, just got moved to the back late in this race because we had so many restarts and stuff like that. Trix went well as well. We had uh, Ryan Priest get up there as well. Okay, so, like, roughly... At least in terms of lap leaders, you know, in the three lines, okay, whatever. At least we kind of fell in the priest and stuff. Um, but, man, there's a lot of variance in this race, a lot of unpredictability. When we look at these races just with a, looking at the caution breakdown, this is all we're looking at. We're not looking at where, who's getting laps ahead. We're not looking at any of that at the moment. Okay, we're looking at how drastically different these races are compared to each other. Okay, now we also need to remember that the green flag or the, the race laps only count... Um, green flag laps. We're not running this race under yellow, otherwise we'd run like 120 laps under yellow here. Okay, year one, let's look at the context entering both races. Year one, literally the first race with the next-gen car, teams only have like three cars in their stable. Depending on what team you are, you only have three cars. We are at a part shortage, we're leaving, you know, how COVID ruined everything. We're running new a huge backlog of, of parts and stuff that haven't even arrived to people. Uh, people are understanding that this is the car that we're going to have to, you know, fix up and run later at Phoenix, Richmond, Martinsville. Hell, we might even be running at 1.5s, whatever the case may be. And so a lot of guys were pretty nice in this race. We didn't see a lot of arguing. We didn't see a lot of fighting and stuff like that. Yeah, sure, we have, you know, the biggest thing of being Larson just throwing Haley into the inside wall. But for the most part, everybody was chill. You know, it's just going green. We run a lap traffic around like lap 19. Um, and then we have, you know, our first yellow. We have Denny Hamlin ran into power steering issues. We have Chase Briscoe breaks a drive train under caution coming into the restart. Tyler Reddick also has an issue under that same uh, yellow flag period. And it's this period right here, the first yellow. We have three guys fall out of the race during this first yellow. You know, 
Hamlin had power steering, but he was overheating. Like, all these guys just caught at the end of the... Like, hey, let's not just tear stuff up. There's no reason to do this. Okay, why is this important? Why is this significant? Because Tyler Reddick was starting second in this race. Tyler Reddick had a great car in practice, a great car in his heat race, started second clearly. Running, um, well, Briscoe was running fourth at the time of the yellow. These were two cars who were doing well in the race. When we look at this race, that is 22. When we look at this race, when we look at... Tyler Reddick and Chase Briscoe, yeah, sure, Briscoe only ran, you know, 50-something laps and was in the top five, you know, not getting necessarily all the fast laps because Bush is, is carrying a lot of that early uh, and they're being spread out. But we're also seeing Reddick, who is in that position as well, scraping off fast laps. He's leading the race, and he, and he falls out. So right off the bat in this first race, we need to understand what we're looking at here. Why did people like Logano, why did people like Keselowski get, not Keselowski, why did people like Kyle Busch get the lead. How did this race play out so differently when we had the dominant leader, the guy who led at the start of the race, get knocked out? We see that he goes from lap to lap. I mean, he's running side by side with, with Kyle Busch, but Kyle Busch falls in line, and then Reddick just runs away. If Reddick doesn't have an issue, we're running into a situation to where Reddick potentially runs away with the race in, instead of having three lap leaders or instead of these laps, or instead of these laps uh, being led between 35 and 64, we might see, you know, Reddick lead closer to 70, closer to the halfway mark, and we typically just see two lap leaders or something like that. So we need to keep everything involved, especially when we're looking at what heats we're looking at, what starting positions we're looking at in terms of laps led, in terms of guys having good cars. There's a lot of different things going into this race that we need to pay attention to. And I want to kind of, I want to try and kind of go go over all the, all the things that I look at here. So when we're entering the week or the weekend and stuff, we have the practices in different groups that go out, run there a lot of time, and then they leave the track, another group comes in, they run there a lot of time, another, they leave, another group comes in, so on and so forth. And we go through a cycle a couple times of people running these laps, and the track drastically changes because rubber is being put down, the track is increasing temperature, or the ambient temperature is decreasing, however you want to look at it in terms of you know heat being put in the track, but you know the sun going down and things of that nature, or just the sun getting later in the day. All this stuff going in the practice sessions and different practice cycles and stuff like that, the practice data in and of itself, in my opinion, is quite useless. Because nobody's on an identical track, they're on at different periods, some guys are having a, a more optimal track condition in terms of what the race is going to be once they're practicing later in the sessions. Like the last group, the last practice session, or the last group, like say if there's like four practice groups or three practice groups, I don't remember exactly how they did it, but it's like, uh, it's like when you defer football in the football game, you know? Do you want to receive or kick off in the first half or in, at, at, you know, entering the second half? Well, if you're at a stadium to where you know the sun is going to be shining in your eyes late in the late in the uh, late in the game in the fourth or whatever, you're going to plan it out to where, OK, I want the uh, defense to be staring at the at the sun in the fourth quarter. You have to plan ahead. And so, like, if you're in a different practice group, you know, if you're in practice group three, and the practice starts, one and two are clearing the track off. We're getting the track ready. Like, they're the first ones on the track. They're putting the rubber down. Once you go out on three, you're getting the first real practice sense, the first real taste of what the car is doing. But then again, that's your first time out. And so, yeah, sure, you go out on a more optimal track condition, but that's your first time. Then you go back, you make adjustments. By the time you go back out some more, the track is even more, um, you know, grooved in or more rubber on the track and stuff like that. And so it constantly changes. And so depending on what track group you're in, like, you might be faster or slower depending on what other groups, but, like, it's because the track is different. You're going at different times. And so, for me, like, I'll pull the laps and stuff, but I'm, I'm not necessarily looking at that. I want to look at how these guys do in their heat races. I want to look at how they're doing. And so, when we look at the cars that traditionally show speed that is replicatable, that is repeating in the race, are the cars who are winning the heats. And it's typically... Heat number two and heat number three. When we're looking at who's starting in these races here, switch here. When we're looking at who's starting in these races here, so heat number one, you know, heat number one, yet again, very similar to the practice. Heat number one is the first practice out. The track is drastically different from how it's going to run the main, so on and so forth. And heat one is, is just, yeah, sure, you qualified well. Excuse me. You had the fastest car. But that doesn't mean a lot when we're looking at a short track like this. We're looking more at the different racers who are winning their heats, locking themselves into the top four positions, okay? And even then, like, it, it just gets fucking freaky. Like, you finish first in heat one, 
you're starting first, you finish second in heat one, you're starting fifth. Like you're already like there's just tiers and tiers down the line. And so when we're looking at lap leaders, we have to specifically look at the people who are winning the heats and how those cars are performing either right off the bat on a restart, how it's rotating through the corners, how it's rotating through the centers. And so we're seeing that at least where I'm at, the position that I would want to focus the most on, and this is just, we have a ton of stuff to go off of, but just right off the bat, I'm like, yeah, I probably want to play the guy starting fucking second. I probably want to play and focus on two lap leaders probably coming from these positions. So when we look at the first year, we have all the lap leaders coming from the top four. Okay, small sample size. We'll look at year number two. When we look at that, we see that that is the wrong one wrong one wrong one here we go when we look at this here hey yet again we have three lap leaders coming from the top four positions Bubba Wallace comes through yet again we have a lot of yellows but just drastically data pointing trying to figure out who's going to lead laps and whatnot there's a good chance your primary lap leaders are coming from I would argue I would argue second place is by far probably the best one just guaranteeing uh, laps led and fast laps. Regardless of what happens in the race, they have the best chance to walk into the lead at some point. You can run the leader down. Typically, when you start second on the outside of the short track, sure, the leader has an advantage right off the bat. But then you can run them down, just like Tyler Reddick did to Kyle Busch. When we look at, like, you know, run them down, like, you're, you're side by side. The rest of the field, they're getting, like, three wide. They're getting stupid. They're racing for positions and stuff like that. Leader controls the restart. You're able to either right, be on his right side for a majority of the first couple laps, or you're able to get beside him, or you're able to pass him, or you're able to just ride in line second place behind him, and you can take advantage of him once he, get the, once he gets in the lap traffic. Okay, when we look at year number two, and we have, you know, Martin Truex Jr., Denny Hamlin, and Eric Amarola, yet again, same thing. Eric Amarola, yes, starting first, able to get that jump off the line because you're the, you're the control card. You're controlling how it starts. But once you run into traffic, once you start running more restarts and stuff like that, the car in second and third place are able to get to you. They're able to ride behind you. They're more likely to get the lead at some point, especially because you're having to carve through lap cars. They're not having to do that. They're just following you through it or using lap cars to slow you down, whatever the case may be. When I'm looking at just primary lap leaders, I'm looking at most likely the guys starting second place and probably the guys starting third. The pulse would probably be a tertiary uh, interest in me uh, projecting for laps, led and fast laps, things of that nature. So that's like the first major takeaway. And we haven't even looked at how the races are playing out. That's just what we're seeing. You know, fast car is going to start up front. It's not that fucking difficult to figure that out, you know? So when we look at race number one here, this race goes by pretty quick. It's a pretty fast event. Very limited yellows, very limited carnage and chaos and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's really just guys running away with the race. I need to get a drink of water. Hold on. So... I don't remember exactly what I was saying, but this race goes pretty green. Leaders are, are pretty there. Like, this race goes green. That's just how it is. Uh, we go last 60 laps or last 40 laps green, whatever. Last year's race, yes, we had a bigger field, which yet again, uh, like, yeah, sure, we're returning to 23 cars this year, but I would not necessarily use this as the sample size, just the data points alone. I would hesitate you on that. Figure out why certain things happen, why... Like, yet again, you might, if you're just looking at it, like, well, you know, second place has only worked, you know, once, <laughs> you know, running this, like, let, let's understand what happened, what broke on certain cars, why certain people led to this happening, why certain things didn't lead to this happening. I would lend, I would lead more towards the race that we would want to look at and have an idea of how this would go more. I would lean it to the 23 car field that we had in 2022, but yet again, that was the first race with this next gen car. A lot of people being gentle, a lot of people, you know, not wanting to destroy stuff. So this is probably on the extreme side of going green, whereas last year was on the extreme side of just racing like a bunch of um, amphibians and just being stupid. Um, so when we're looking at this year, or last year, we have more people running, uh, the same amount of people, you know, wrecking out and stuff. But we have a lot of turmoil in this event in terms of guys getting spun sideways, people wrecking into each other, single car spins, huge instants, like huge pileups, like just track block blockers, you know? We have like two guys spin out. It's in the center of the corner. People just have to stop and stuff like that. And we see that we have very limited green flag runs here. And so when we're looking at this race in terms of fast laps, we're seeing, what is the total here? We have, this is, oh no, it's not. I forgot. They're not counted. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Why is that 150? Yeah, it's because, uh, duh, they're not counting yellows, Brandon. But we're seeing that the 
and cars that are either up front during certain periods of the race, like it, or that have a higher track position, able to stay up and avoid the stupid chaos that they ran into is getting laps led and stuff like that. Whereas here in this, I forgot I have like three different tabs. Whereas here, it is just it is literally primarily the uh, the guys up front competed for the win. All the fast laps literally came from the guys up front. That was it. There was no shuffling. There was nobody getting stupid like that. If you were up front, you were getting fast laps. That's the end-all be-all. That's this one here. That is laps led. It is still here. But, like, the majority of is, is going to the guys who are running in the top four positions and the top positions in general. Whereas here, you know, the fast laps are pretty much all spread out. Um, and you're typically getting them, you know, when you're running up front. But yet again, like, Eric Amarola gets these 13 fast laps and leads these laps and falls through the field. And so, like, he's not getting any more of those. Truex inherits the lead. He's getting those fast laps. Hamlin is running first and second behind Truex. It's, you know, these guys are swapping positions. They're getting the fast laps. Uh, Bubba Wallace, you know, gets to the lead, runs off some fast laps, things of that nature. You know, Priest, who <clears throat> probably had the best car in traffic, probably had the best car, like, actually able to do stuff. Yet again, gets involved in late weight race stuff and has to fall through the field. And so when we're looking at this event, I don't necessarily want to view it as um, a chaos-filled wreck or a chaos-filled race like this one. But when we're looking at people who are... I am bouncing off the place. When we're looking at... Let's get it back to DraftKings points here. We'll do it here. When we're looking at how to project for this race, like, clearly we need... We're probably going to have two place differential guys, like, actually go through and actually gain probably eight to nine positions. If you can do that, you have a real chance of scoring and being one of the top scores. Let's actually get both of these on here. Let's do this real fast. So when we're looking at these two races here, specifically just from a, a DraftKings point of view, what are we seeing here? Okay, so we're seeing that, yes, you're you're going to need the main lap leader, and you're most likely going to need the winner, like that, duh. Probably going to need that, unless the later... Just comes from out of nowhere, wrecks the guy who leads all the laps, and then just walks into it. Um, but we're tip. What I'm looking specifically at is the amount of people probably scoring over 38 points here. Okay, at least for me, when I'm looking at how I need to project stuff or how I need to anticipate projecting things, and so yet again, just act like one and two don't exist. So we're looking at uh, 11 cars here, and both of them, 11 cars. Last year, 12 cars the year before, right at 38 points. That is probably what my pool would end up being at. What is, um, what is the, what are the traits? What are the defining factors of guys scoring 38 points in this event? So let's kind of highlight these guys right fast. And let's act like these poor guys don't exist. Just erase them from uh, history. So what are we finding between these are we finding, you know, a lot of place differential guys coming through or place differential guys just coming through by themselves? Or are they being carried by fast laps, things of that nature? So where are the lap leaders coming from? Yet again, year one, we lose a lap leader with um, Tyler Reddick being taken out. But you remove him, and then you compare it to 2023, did like, okay, yeah, the build isn't that crazy. It's two lap leaders, two lap leaders. You need both these guys in the optimal lineup. Okay, and I don't. I also don't have the optimal lineup, so I'm just kind of going off of what, uh, I would assume it would be built like and stuff like that because I don't have the salaries or anything otherwise. I just run and put it together. But we're seeing that Austin Dillon has somehow miraculously come through in both these races from the 10th spot, which would be 10th would be, where is 10th? That is like third heat number two or one, one of those. Um, mid-tier car, so we're seeing a mid-tier car. So when we look specifically at the drivers starting between actually here let me let me bring this up here and then compare that with DraftKings hold on this might be easier to look at and pay attention to or notice so when we're looking at the heats here what is the what is the defining characteristic between these starting positions and these drivers and how they're performing in these races, okay? So we're seeing in both these races, we're seeing like 16th, 10th, 14th, 11th, 12th, uh, 10th, 16th. I'm looking primarily for between like 10th and 16th here. So we have 14, we'll count 11 here. 
We're not going to count 18 yet. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have five guys between, I don't even remember what I was doing. So between like 10th to 18th, uh, 10th to, what did I say, 16th? Okay, so why is this important here? What is being shown between 10th and 16th? So when we're looking here, 10th and 16th is your third and fourth place drivers from the heat races, okay? So yes, we have, you know, we have all these fuckos in these races, and we have, like, these guys who are just slow as molasses. We have these guys who transfer in, like, we're not caring about them at the moment. We're not worried about these guys. We're trying to find the people who have realistic cars who are going to fight to be optimal or fight to be good scorers that aren't your lap leaders, okay? Because we've already identified that, hey, fast cars, your lap leaders, that's the top four positions. You know, take your pick, whatever the case may be, but it's most likely like first, second, and third are your primary guys that you'd want to argue to be your lap leaders and blah, 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 blah. We're looking at how to build the rest of the lineup. So what are the characteristics being d displayed? We could probably include ninth as well. I should probably do that. So we'll include ninth. Is there a ninth in here? Any nines? Uh, any nines? No nines. So we'll just... I'm going to leave it to nine because that would be heat race one third finisher. We'll leave it there for now. So when we're looking at this, you know, these are the guys from are finishing third and fourth. So that means that regardless of how they started that heat, you know, yeah, sure. It's 25 lap or whatever. You're most likely not catching the leader because yet again, leader controls the race. They control the restart. They're primarily finding second and third or they're primarily fighting each other. The first two guys are primarily fighting each other. Second and third place finishers in the heat races are typically displaying cars that are having a good amount of speed. You just weren't able to get to the leader for whatever whatever happened, whatever the case may be. But you're clearly faster than the rest of the field. You know, like your car is actually competent. You can actually do something there. Okay? So when we're looking at these, yes, we're also trying to pay attention of what lap leader is is performing the best in the track which is pretty easy to write down notes because fox will primarily just end up watching the battle for the lead it's really difficult to fit to watch the battle for third and fourth unless it's in like the peripheral or the background of the of the race that's going on here but what i want to focus more on are the guys in this range specifically for the race on sunday because we have shown, and it's shown time and time again, that, hey, if you're like the third or fourth best car in your heat race, that would mean, let's see, do they show qualifying? They don't show the qualifying, how it breaks down. Um, but, like, you're not bad. Like, you know, that is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's the top 16. Your top 16 cars are represented in... in in, in, you know, between these positions, between, you know, between these positions, duh. Yet again, and, and we're looking for we're primarily 12 guys who are start probably need to, hold on, probably need to do this. So we're looking for, you know, basically 13 to 14 guys who are going to be able to put down those laps, put that there, okay. We're looking for like 12 to 14 guys. Well, hey, you know, a good portion of that field who are going to finish up there are either going to be <clears throat> um, are either going to be guys who gain place differential from the back of the field, truly like passing a lot of people, either the guys starting last, guys starting like, yeah, I mean, last year we had like 22nd and 23rd, both being the top 13 of scoring, but we have, we've had 18, 23, basically the guy in last place just shows up and he doesn't have to do anything stupid. And he can pass people as they wreck out and stuff. <clears throat> we have like 18th, 21st, 19th, and stuff like that. Like, yes, clear place, different plays coming through. But for the most part, if we're either aiming for your top four guys leading laps or you're aiming for these guys in blue here, you got a real chance of landing on multiple drivers who are going to end up scoring in the high 48s and 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 finding to be optimal. <clears throat> at least for me, that's how I would look at this data. That's how it. That's how I would interpret it. And I don't think I'm necessarily making that up or trying to find something that fits my own accord. Let's get this here. 
but I think that is how that is my, that would be my takeaway of this. And when we start looking back at these races, you know, these guys that I have highlighted blue, <clears throat> yes, they offer place differential, but they offer cars that are going to be competent, that are faster, clearly faster than a good portion of the field, and guys that are going to compete to be scoring well in DraftKings, which is really all we care about. Like, we don't give a flying shit where these guys finish <clears throat> or where they uh, where they finish. We're just focusing on, like, kind of where they're starting, what their upsides are, and what they end up leading DraftKings-wise. You know, yet again, <clears throat> so you have, your pl- you have your primary lap leaders coming from, you know, the first three, first four positions here, whereas second... Haley, I mean, Haley got fast laps, got wrecked, (laughs) got taken out, but still was there. So these would be your, we're looking for fourth here. Byron didn't really do squat, but green is like your first four finishers. B would be the guys who are finishing in in this range between your, excuse me, your third and fourth place finishers and heats. For the most part, if you're playing those guys, like if you just build with that pool, and you primarily chase those guys, you're going to land on a build that works out. That is going to most likely land on a majority of those guys finishing in in the top 12 scoring. Especially when we get down to even a smaller field of 23 cars and stuff. You know, like that. that's kind of where I'd want to go on. Yeah, sure. Like, we'll have place differential come through. <clears throat> and we'll have unknowns that happen in, in races that cause people to either fall out, like Eric Amarola falling through the field. We have, you know, Daniel Reddick, uh, Daniel Reddick, Tyler Reddick, you know, having mechanical issues and stuff. But for the most part, when I when I view the clash and I kind of look through all the bullshit and chaos and all the insane stuff that's going on, this would this would kind of be my takeaway. That's that's kind of the approach I want to have. And uh, at least for me. That's really all I, I want to look at for the clash. I don't really see a reason to, you know, like I rewatched these races. Yeah, sure, it was crazy, but there's like really nothing out of the ordinary. These are similarities between these two races that um, I think are repeatable, that I think are happening in the races, that I think we could see happen again. And this is just kind of how I would go. Oh, and the reason why I brought up the pool, like if you just use a pool of like those primary guys, of these primary people here, yeah, sure, you're going to run into issues where some guys fall through the field. And then you'll you'll run into an issue where, like, hey, I have to play a value play. I can't play all these guys here. Well, then probably just play the best point per dollar play in the back half of the field or whoever the cheapest is, either safety of starting, like, dead last or close to last that offers place differential or just the best point per dollar play that's left over. Like, I just feel like that's how I, that's how I would want to build the lineups and stuff. And I probably, at least looking back at how I did last year, like, I probably didn't necessarily do that. Like, look at the guys that I'm focusing on here, at least – like, I didn't focus enough on the guys that I wanted to. Um, I probably should have just been more aggressive on these guys. I probably would end up on more Priest. I probably would end up on more Blaney and stuff. Um, probably should have had, you know, and I don't have, I don't think I have the other years. But and anyway, just from me kind of looking at what I did last year, it was like, okay, you know, I, at least for me, okay, that's I'm seeing things I want to do. I'm seeing things of how I kind of want to go about this race, especially because it's just a one-off. Like, this date is fucking useless. We're not using the LA Clash for anything else. We're not using anything for the LA Clash entering this weekend. We're just using, you know, our eyes. We're using, sure, we could look at the lap practice data, but we're mainly just using our eyes. We're mainly looking at seeing who is better in traffic and things of that nature. So that's that's how I would do. That, that's how I would go about it. And uh, that's kind of just my, my look and preview and... I guess review of the clash. I don't know. I'm just going to title this clash 2024. We'll see what happens. I will uh, see you guys in the next episode. And uh, hopefully you'll have some, you'll have some information on the NASCAR package, maybe in the next video or so. Well, I'll keep you updated. So I'll see you guys later.